Good evening, guys. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope uh, you are excited for one of the most interesting sessions. I think I am allowed to be a little biased towards the session that I am moderating. So, uh, welcome. Uh, first of all, I want to definitely welcome Saksham and Prakash to this. They bring a wealth of amazing experience across payments, fintech to this panel. Uh, we have Saksham here, who is the co-founder of Swift Money, which is a really cool personal wealth management app. I know a lot of you would be already very much, very well integrated into how wealth management works. And we will have some great insights coming in from Saksham's end. And we also have Prakash, who is the senior director for global payments at Flywire, and uh, which is a company which manages global payments and specifically focuses on remittances as well. So uh, welcome, Prakash, and welcome, Saksham. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. So uh, guys, I think uh, the, the most important thing that we have to acknowledge here is that the world order is changing. And I'm not just talking about uh, Elon Musk taking over Twitter, but it's technology, right? At the end of the day, uh, the way technology is changing the entire landscape, whether it comes to banking, whether it comes to financial services, whether it comes to our day-to-day -day transactions like commerce, there's, there's a lot which has changed. And what we would love to talk about a little bit and delve deeper into is how our regular transactions and what are the most important trends that have happened across when it comes to the BFSI sector, or rather, which we much more fondly like to uh, call as fintech. So our focus would kind of be a little bit more about that and delve deeper into some of the areas there. Uh, as, as we are all aware, I think the world is resurging from a very global event, the pandemic, and while there's a great sentiment in terms of, from a consumer perspective in terms of spending, also there is looming this large winter when it comes to the entire recession, recessionary trends that we have seen coming in from Western side. While India has kind of been resistant to it, but uh, I think there's a lot to, for us to uncover that in terms of what technology is playing a role in this entire setup. So probably, uh, you know, moving over to you, uh, uh, you know, Saksham, first of all. Uh, my first question is, want to understand a little bit more about wealth management. So if you look at it this way, wealth management has traditionally been the moot of the wealthy, right? This was uh, being done in small offices with, uh, you know, high net worth individuals focusing in terms of how wealth management works. And today, uh, all of a sudden, it has become democratic, right? It has become super popular, everyone is kind of getting into wealth management and everyone is kind of enjoying it. So uh, we want to understand, like while we have seen a lot of uh, plethora of companies coming up and what is the specific agenda that you see in terms of how this entire domain is evolving and what are the new trends that you see coming up here? So after this technological advancements, right, we got this really great model of hybrid advisory and robo-advisory actually. So, it, it's a very simple fact. If a human is involved everywhere, things cannot scale, right? It's a very simple and straightforward fact. A human is there, a human can only manage. Example, there is some kind of uh, registered investment advisor. He can only take maybe 10 clients per day, right? 12 clients per day, right? So, if he's taking 10, 12 clients per day, oh, and uh, what kind of knowledge he has, he should be earning a great sum of money, you know, per month. So he has to work on his economics, right? So a human is there, it automatically becomes, you know, non-scalable thing. That's where the technology had to come, right? So oh, they were pioneers in technology. I, if, if people must know here, Black Rocks of the world, Vanguards of the world, and maybe so many other wealth management, asset, asset management companies are working from 1980s, 1990s. They started the technological development in-house in only. So they can take this wealth management and, you know, uh, wealth management, asset management things to greater masses. And uh, that, tech that technology has made uh, this specific, you know, as you said, it democratized uh, the complete wealth management services and stuff. So this technology being, uh, you know, in the form of robo-advisory and hybrid advisory brought, uh, brought this uh, wealth management and wealth advisory services to the masses. And I think it will, it will eventually grow. Right now we are not leaving everything on technology, but once it gets smart enough to handle every part of it for years and years, so it's the best thing which could happen, right? So this will be a completely automated process as you see it happening. It has to be because we have all the data which happened in the past. You know, markets are very much like that. 
they tend to repeat themselves in some or the other way, right? So it has the data. There will be some amount of human intervention always involved which cannot go, like, but it will be a very small amount after a while. Right now it's majorly which is going, it's a hybrid advisory model where it's almost, you know, 30, 40% still the human intervention is involved. Till we get till, you know, 10%, 20%, yeah, it will be the perfect thing which could happen. But that requires the technology to be so much advanced and so much smart that it does not require a human involvement. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, Prakash, I think, I, I think cross-border payments, remittances in general is a very, very fascinating area. It's been ages that we continue to continue to build on it, innovate on it. And in fact, I think post-pandemic, that has definitely seen a bigger rise across, right? Because borders have become a little bit more porous and people are moving much more money across, whether it is from P2P or it is P2M. Uh, when we talk about cross-border, on the other side, while there is a lot of growth, there's also a lot of regulation, right? So one thing that I want to get a sense of is how do you kind of balance growth while also taking care of compliance from this perspective, specifically in India, which is where the regulation landscape is changing significantly fast? It's, it's a very relevant question in our context, Ankur. Uh, just to sort of give an overview of how cross-border remittance, what's the scale of cross-border remittance in India? India is expected to receive $100 billion this year in inward remittances. Yeah? And it's always been in the top two or three countries in terms of inward remittances. So typically, it's China, Philippines, India. These are the typical markets which receive a lot of inbound remittances. India is also a very significant market for outbound remittances. So. There are Indians who are purchasing pr property abroad. Indians are going abroad to study. Uh, people are sending money to their relatives abroad. So there is quite a few transactions, a, a very large number of transactions which are on the outbound side as well. You know, that, that's, that's actually roughly about $20 billion. If I take only the current, um, you know, uh, current account transactions, not the capital account transactions. It's typically called liberalized remittance scheme. That's that's what RBI calls that, that group of yeah. remittances. Now, one of the good things that have happened uh, in the last couple of years and during the pandemic, uh, post the pandemic, is RBI has actually t taken a very forward-looking stance in terms of what they want to do with regulations. Remittances have, has, the regulations around remittances have typically been very archaic in India, where you know you have to walk into a bank, uh, fill up a lot of forms, and they might you know ask you on on hundreds of KYC documents. Yeah, that's changing quite a bit. And one of the good things that have happened, which you know we should probably take cognizance of, is the sandbox approach taken by the Reserve Bank of India. That's actually true. Sandbox yeah. has been a game changer across. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know. It might just look innocuous because nothing has been approved in a big way, but the fact is that the sandbox has allowed the regulator and the players in the ecosystem to work very, very closely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, one of one of the cohorts one was you know a very interesting cohort was how Indians can invest in Nasdaq. Yeah, and that was a cohort which was proposed by the Reserve Bank of India, and approval has been given. Yeah. Now, this forward-looking approach of Reserve Bank of India bodes well, you know, and, and I would say that every entity in the ecosystem, be it the regulator, the participants, the consumer, we need to take, we, we probably need to take note of three things. One is the ease of payment will be the single important factor which drives, up, drives the numbers on cross-border remittances. Absolutely. Yeah? The minute you add ease, to outward or inward payments, then the, the sheer volume will go up. Yeah, just give you a, giving you an example. Now, you can actually use Bharat bill payment system even if you are in Dubai. Absolutely, I think building BBPS for cross-border uh, sandbox environment. Some of these are very positive regulatory changes across. Absolutely. So, you know, so one part. So I have three important points here to sort of touch upon. One is ease of payments, so it, it bodes well for the ecosystem that everybody's focused on that, including the regulator. Yeah, otherwise they will not make things like 
bar bill payments as you know Sorry. payments from abroad and, and all of that. So the regulator itself is focused on that. Yes. The second most important bit, which sort of is never given an attention, is how the KYC part of the transaction will happen. Yeah. Now, what happens is when 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 there are fintechs and new entities which start coming into cross-border payments, this is one part which always remains great. Yeah? And suddenly, th there is one fintech which has already gone to about $500 million in volume, and suddenly there's an RBI audit, and then business comes to a standstill. Yeah? Now, what happens here is... And that, endanger, that endangers actually consumer money as well. It endangers the consumer money. Yeah. It endangers the ecosystem as well. Ecosystem. Yeah, because then RBI becomes more cautious. Yeah? And you know other regulatory entities become more cautious. Yeah. It's super important for everybody, every participant in the ecosystem to understand that we want to probably club ease of payment with the KYC part, which should be smoother. With a lot of these new areas which are coming up, which is like account aggregator, where you can do a KYC check and somebody can give you an API, all these things need to be used extensively to give comfort to the regulator and all other entities who are monitoring these transactions. Because these transactions are getting reported centrally, right? Uh, and, and, and that's part of government data. So that's the second part that everybody probably needs to take note of. The third part is how do you sort of embellish the customer support? Yeah, Ease of payment has come. KYC can be done through an API. How do you ensure that if somebody is trying to track a transaction, he's given an answer real time, yeah? And there are bots which have come, and there are a lot of, you know, sort of investments going into this space. But these three elements, you know, when it's sort of working with each other in tandem, we are actually talking about a, a very robust regulatory environment to do new cross-border business. No, absolutely, and that makes a lot more sense because the more trade that happens across, the more it uh, kind of helps our economy grow. So Absolutely. I'm sure that the regulator takes a very balanced view when it comes to in terms of how to grow the business while ensuring that there is the comfort or the layer which is built around it. Actually, th I have a very uh, slightly different kind of a question section that I want to ask you. Yeah. When you talk about wealth management, one of the asset classes which has really emerged in the last, I would say, two to three years has been digital currency, right? We have seen a lot of investment which has happened there from a uh, you know investment perspective, from a trading perspective. But, uh, and plus it has seen its own uh, highs and lows. I mean, it's a super volatile, uh, as an asset class, it is super volatile. So what I want to understand from you is, uh, in terms of wealth management, what is the point of view that you would take as a co-founder in terms of what is the regulation, because we were talking about that, around digital currency when it comes to it. And Government in India has taken a very forward view there as well with the launch of CBDC and e rupee. So, what is your point of view there in terms of how that will shape up? See, uh, cryptocurrencies and these kind of digital currencies, I would say, when unregulated, they are, uh, you know, <laughs> a big danger actually. When unregulated, because anything can happen there. I get it, it has its own pros, right? It's unregulated and, uh, you know, it's, it's decentralized. Stable coin is not stable again, right? <laughs> exactly. Even the stable coins are not stable. You know, That's the true. name is not even respected there. Yeah, so, and they, they were meant to be stable, right? So, these are the things which are very much, you know, uh, as of uh, if we come and we manage people's wealth, right? At that point, we, you have to be super cautious. You cannot put anyone's wealth in, you know, okay, okay, take a few cryptocurrencies. No, you cannot do that. Um, and until and unless they are regulated, like very much rightly. So I always see that um, the regulator is the land, okay? And whatever you build on, build on it, it's the, you know, your port, okay? You might build a really great port, okay? But if the, if the regulator is not like, you know, it's not, uh, it's not good enough and it's not strong enough, it will make you fall, right? So that's where cryptocurrencies and these kind of digital currencies in some way or the other, either the indirect way, you know, maybe the broker's way, maybe, you know, in some or the other way, they have to be regulated. Otherwise, no wealth management will be able to work with that. So I, uh, even, uh, the, even in the US, which is comparatively much ahead of us in terms of this, even uh, what I heard there 
uh, their wealth managers are not also, you know, advising more than one percent in any kind of cryptocurrencies. Not more than one percent. Understood. And that makes a lot more sense. I think you have to be really smart with your money at the end of the day. Yeah. Be, uh, so be uh, j just wanted to put it there. Blockchain in its own way, it's an amazing technology. The technology, a, the underlying yeah. technology is amazing, but yeah. I think the use cases which have exactly been in which them. use case people have brought it. You know, maybe the entrepreneurs have brought it. It's kind of risky right now, so it has to be regulated because there is money related, right? There is money related. You cannot play around with money. People live for money. Absolutely. Very much simple. So you cannot just play around with that. It has to be regulated by some government entity or maybe some kind of entity there. It has oh, to That absolutely out. makes sense. Actually, uh, Prakash, I would also like your opinion on this. Because, you know, with digital currency, the remittances that are happening cross-border, they just become a breeze. Like maybe, uh, as you know, Saksham was talking about, that's one advantage that blockchain brings is that it provides a lot of security or, you know, underlying digital certification to the movement of data that is happening, whether it is currency, whether it is anything else. Now, from a cross-border perspective, do you also see that digital currency is playing a positive role there? Uh, you know, Ankur, so there's a very interesting paper which has been published by Bank of Interna International Settlements around how CBDCs of different countries can bring ease to cross-border payments. Very interesting paper. Now, you know, at the onset, you know, if you just talk about the efficiencies which can come in to connecting CBDCs and, and using that distributed ledger technology to move money from one place to another. So some of the ease that will come on the table is you, you, the, the, the need to have intermediaries within the system comes down. The cost of payments come down. The efficiency around how the information is being passed from one entity to another becomes far more smoother and seamless. These are the advantages which come in. Now, now what happens is that these are advantages. Yeah? And if you see, now you know, we have CBDC in India, e yuan has been is, is in the test mode. One of the things that came up in conversation uh, when there was a survey which was conducted for 50 regulatory bodies globally central bank regulators, there is, there is still a little bit of reluctance to go all out in, on this. One of the other advantages I actually forgot is that even the foreign exchange you know, fluctuations, the risk around foreign exchange fluctuations can be mitigated by CBDCs, by exactly. connecting the CBDCs. No? Exactly. Now, the flip side and why the central banks across the globe are slightly cautious about it is in a, in a lot of ways, there are certain risks attached to it. There's a huge element of cyber risk and frauds happening around CBDCs getting con converted into fiat currency. Yeah. Until that cyber security aspect of it is completely solved for, I think that is one of the major risks that will face any digital currency which comes into picture. Absolutely. And, and what happens is that it's not easy for because you know these things can start interfering with monetary policies of different governments at the same time yeah now we one of the and, and, and the fact is that while everybody accepts the fact that the the underlying blockchain technology the crypto element will sort of ease up cross border payments because the information gets seamlessly passed from one entity to another i see a lot of caution around how this is going to progress? Everybody understands that, you know, this this is this is going to be great. You know, for example, you know, it's it's similar to what Ripple has done. You know, where an next rapid crypto easily passes information from one entity to another. Yeah. But you know, when it comes to central bank digital currencies and that being a crypto in the blockchain technology, everybody wants to be very cautious. No, absolutely, and um, that that makes a lot more sense because there are like like a very uh, usual thing. There are pros, there are cons. I think the right way is that the implementation that the government and the companies at the end of the day figure Absolutely. out, that is exactly going to be the game changer when it comes to digital currencies. End users' money cannot be in danger, very simply. Absolutely. And uh, when we talk about end users, I think I also want to touch upon some of the consumer payment space because at the end of the day, all of us work to kind of ensure that the consumer has the best experience. One of the things, Saksham, 
uh, that has emerged in the consumer payment space has been BNPL, buy now, pay later. And I think buy now, pay later has just become so synonymous that you see that happening everywhere, whether it is somebody selling, uh, you know, consumer durables, they are selling services everywhere. It's, uh, you know, X, uh, now, Y, later, that, that has just become a moniker, right? So, uh, but I think it has impacted consumer payments significantly. What is your point of view when it comes to, you know, this unstructured lending which has come through? Because also, uh, we are also, we continue to talk about regulation as well. And, uh, you know, when, I, when it comes to lending, RBI has been very cautious, right? But whereas BNPL has definitely taken the imagination of the people. So how do you see both of these things coming and running parallel? So, uh, as Prakar said, you know, ease of doing payment, you know, how easy it will be, it will directly impact your, you know, everything, right? Maybe uh, they were talking about, you know, the remittances, but I, I, I'll talk about here even the, you know, e-commerce buying which is happening now. So people, just because it's buy now, pay later, they spend n number of amount, which is not even in their pocket, very simply put, right? It's, it's not yeah. even in their pocket. And just like how, how credit works at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, it's, to an extent, it's a really good thing because what the country's dream is to achieve, you know, maybe five trillion economy, six trillion economy, whatever the dream is. It cannot happen until everyone has, you know, that kind of money in their hand. They cannot, they, they cannot achieve that kind of GDP. They cannot achieve that kind of growth. People, you know, uh, people from tier three, tier four cities, they have to have credit in their hand. And it should be so much accessible, right? Uh, and uh, I'd say the regulator is doing a really good job on that. Amazing job. Uh, NPCI started this UPI buy now pay later, which is capped to 15,000 bucks per month, right? But it's, it's still a good thing. Uh, and you know, you don't even need to do a, uh, a long uh, process of KYC for that. You just have to put your few details and that's done, right? To 15,000 uh, 15, rupees a month you have ordered. And it's a good amount to start with. So uh, NPCI brought that uh, with, uh, with UPI buy now pay later. And these kind of things are fastening the, you know, credit, the accessibility process. And the best part is about that, uh, when you put that money in user's hand, everyone grows, everyone grows. But the end problem still remains. How to get that money back, it's, it's still there. You can never, you can never overcome that problem. But somehow, uh, I, I was uh, really happy seeing, you know, fintech companies doing, uh, doing in this, uh, you know, invoicing on, on the basis right. of invoices they are providing credits, as well as on the basis of their cash flows they are providing credits, and they sign, uh, they, they sign this, uh, you know, uh, as soon as the money comes in bank account, you just have to pay it directly. It gets cut off. So these kind of small things are enabling the whole process to be smoother. But the point you the the point you brought uh, that un you know unstructured credit, I'd say at at a point if you see it's really important for the economy. It's really important. No, I, you're absolutely right. One of the biggest changes that uh, BNPL did was kind of bring into fold a lot of new to credit customers yeah. who were previously not you know uh, easily First banked or easily yeah. getting a credit line from the existing structures like credit cards or otherwise. I think with the BNPL and fintech apps coming in that landscape has significantly changed and that exactly. has really been impacted. When we, when we talk about consumer side of the business, even in uh, cross-border, uh, Prakash, one of the things which, uh, which I see will be disruption is, uh, you know, real-time remittances like UPI coming into picture. Like, at, like how we know very well how UPI has changed the landscape of digital payments in India. And now NPCI has been uh, very forward-looking in terms of taking UPI global as well. So how do you see that impacting cross-border remittances? Because something like UPI working seamlessly across multiple currencies and multiple countries is a dream, I would say, when it comes to remittances. Absolutely, Ankur. Uh, you know, I, I, I make this statement in quite a few forums. There might just be a UPI moment on the anvil for cross-border payments. Yeah? By, by, by that, actually, what I mean is that you know, we understand how quickly the payments can happen in India, right? Of course, there's a 100,000 INR limit on the transaction. But imagine the steps which are being taken by NPCI in terms of just building the connectivity globally. Right. Now, one of the use cases which is almost on the anvil of getting live is the connectivity between, between the real-time uh, payment system in India and Singapore. 
Correct. Yes. Yeah. And and I I, I have close visibility to this because we work with pay now actually. Now imagine that you are, are a person who is in India and in, you are trying to send money to Singapore and trying to do it real time on the basis of a phone number. Yeah. Now that changes a lot of things fundamentally in cross border payments because you know typically the journey is that you had to you have to add the beneficiary details you know want to ensure that the ABA code is proper the transit code is proper the all of that sheer comes into picture ease of sending money to another person by just remembering the phone number i think that's revolutionary yeah and and that's you know the the good part is it, we, i admit that we are still in early days in terms of exploring this and we want to see how it go you know we are all very sort of keen to see how it's going to pan out but the fact is that you know npci is going is npci is actually going all out in terms of building that connectivity with the pay now coming into picture the the conversation which has happened with world line in europe the lyra network in france imagine a day where npci is connected to faster payments in uk or the ach system in us yeah. right and then you know you have a phone number uh, of the beneficiary you use that phone number to transfer the money so you know my statement that there might be a upi moment on the anvil for cross border payments i'll probably make that statement for the next 6 months no absolutely like i said it's a dream and dreams do come true so fingers crossed i think this is not very far off in terms of how it will happen uh, one of the one of the last things that i definitely want to touch upon is uh, like i was talking about uh, you know there has been this entire atmosphere of a funding winter right where there has been a lot of uh, you know challenges which the industry has faced in general globally however when you when you come and look at india india has been the success story of 2022 i would say whether it comes to our manufacturing whether it comes to our technology i think there has been significantly good tailwinds that we have seen which have kept us growing further and further right the outlook for 2023 is again positive but when we think about 2023 and the years coming further i would love to understand uh, the point of view in terms of which sectors within technology or even maybe outside of technology when it comes to say manufacturing when it comes to say a pharma which are some of those sectors where you see technology playing a significant role and specifically fintech easing these uh, growth uh, you know measures e into the country saksham maybe you can go first so why india keeps on growing that's my personal point of view it's it's very simple i i remember india is one of the biggest nbfcs i was reading their uh, annual statement and what their uh, success mantra was diverse diversify your money in a way that nothing can affect you right it's very simple but it's simple but uh, you know an amazing thing very powerful so uh, in india you see we have technology we have production we have agriculture we have pharma sectors we have almost every sector which you can imagine right we even have our own uh, minerals to like you know we have our own resources comparatively less but yeah we still have a part of them so at that seeing that i feel india grows in every kind of situation we have our own resources we have our own technology we have you know great leadership going on so india keeps india will keep on growing and uh, maybe a, Com comparatively much faster than this and uh, yeah sorry i'll i lost your last uh, line no so the idea was that uh, do technology play a role in terms of this growth story entirely because so far the technology sector in india has seen record number of you know foreign investments coming in yeah. record growth which has happened in fact india has exported its technology to other countries now yeah. how do you see that impacting us so uh, i i feel i feel uh, in in that term if you see technology is going to stay constantly growing at that point other sectors will grow but uh, technology is the one which will make other sectors grow because technology is something which eases everything right it's very simple it it eases everything you know maybe you are uh, running a manufacturing plant new technology comes it eases it eases your production you know your productivity gets increased right so i i feel the sector of technology will keep on growing really fast and other sectors will be you know with it growing so yeah technology is the main sector which i would tell to focus on yeah fantastic so prakash i i see that saksham is super gungo about india and about technology in the coming years i want to know whether you share his enthusiasm or do you have a more reserved outlook on this one uh 
you know what? I, I'm going to answer this question slightly differently, uh, Ankur. So the per capita income of India would be about $7,000. For China, it's about $20,000, right? We have a long way to go. Now, uh, now, some of the things that are happening in India are extremely positive. Yeah. Yeah? Now, and I, I'll, I'll probably touch upon three elements which I feel are, are, are things that we can probably look at. You look at the entire banking ecosystem in India. 80% yeah? of Indians are supposed to have a bank account. Yeah? Now, after jam happened and all of that happened, right? Now, 38% of that is inactive. Yeah, so what, what happens is we have, we have to start this chain of consumption and the banking penetration needs to be relevant. Yeah? I think technology can be a huge enabler while doing that. You know, you talk about banking correspondents, somebody having a digital device and getting the, the penetration done in tier three, tier four areas. I think there is a, there's a huge theme around banking penetration, consumption, and jobs, and new services coming to fore, thereby creating the momentum that is required. So that's one area. So banking, financial services, insurance, all these are growth enablers. And technology would be the core skeletal around which the penetration can happen, as per me. The second area, which I feel is, is, is something that India should probably, you know, India's already encouraged in a big way, and we have 100 unicorns in India. Yeah? Absolutely. 2022 we was a great year for India yeah. from a unicorn perspective, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, wh what we sometimes tend to forget, we, we do talk about funding winters and valuation and all of that. Sometimes we, f we actually forget that these unicorns are creating jobs. Yeah? Now, imagine somebody who has not got an access to a job 10 years back because these unicorns did not exist and those jobs did not exist then. We sometimes sort of miss this point and miss this theme where we, you know, we sort of only talk about valuations, EBITDA, you know, funding winters and all of that. But the fact is that this momentum, make in India, unicorns, all of that is creating jobs which, are, which aid in consumption and growth. Yeah. The third thing I, I, I feel is a very different sort of a uh, piece which also needs to be talked about is what public enterprises can do in India. Yeah. Now, I am just, I'm, I'm just talking about certain um, specimens. For example, you know, IRCTC is supposed to be the largest, one of the largest manufacturers of bottled water in India, yeah? Now, imagine the kind of jobs, uh, it has about nine plants in India, what I understand, yeah? Yeah, so this is one, I'm just giving you one specimen. LIC, for example, has 65% market share in India, yeah? But if you ask me today, is it easy to go and pay an LIC premium, no, yeah? Now, if you see all these public enterprise assets that we have, yeah? whether they can create a momentum in terms of creating jobs, creating new products, yeah? Why can't an LIC or an IRCTC be a super app where you can book anything, like a Grab in Singapore or a Gojek in Malaysia, right? Now, so these are three things that, you know, I would probably look at and, and think that the future is super positive for India. No, I think that's fantastic, uh, Prakash, because uh, I think what you have very correctly put across, uh, and in fact, both of you, is that while there's a lot of positive energy that we see for India, and but technology obviously plays a great role into it, but outside of technology also, there are so much more uh, disruption, there's so much more growth, which is possible for us. And I think technology will only be an enabler in that direction, specifically when it comes to BFSI sector, when it comes to banking, when it comes to FinTech, when it comes to overall financial services, as the trends are coming up, whether it is wealth management, whether it is lending, whether it is embedded finance, each of these things have kind of come up in a big way and supplemented the consumer's accessibility to these services. I think it has been a great journey for technology companies in general for this entire setup. And, and uh, I think in general, I think we're very gungo about it. Uh, just to, uh, you know, end this, I would uh, like to check if there are any questions that we have. Cool. 
I think we are good at it. Thank you so much, guys. I think this was a fantastic Thank conversation. You. I really enjoyed, uh, you know, getting your views. And thanks again. Thank Same you. Same here, Ankur. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much.